You know, in the spirit of transparency, there's something I think I need to share with you tonight to get behind us. It's something that uh, happened when I was young. It happened in a moment of uh, youth, bravado, testosterone. I did something. I wore spandex on TV. Not any spandex, but red spandex with sequins. You know, but I didn't stop at spandex. Uh, I also did movies. I actually did a movie with Meryl Streep. And this movie was called Death Becomes Her. And uh, I had this scene with Meryl where Meryl walks into the room and she asks me where somebody's sitting. And I point over there to Isabel Rossellini and I say, she's sitting over here. So the rehearsal goes great. When it comes time to film the scene, Meryl walks in like this, and now she's standing across from me and she starts doing this. And I think, this is acting. I'm doing a scene with Meryl Streep, this is so cool. So we get done with the scene, I run over to Meryl and I say, Meryl, that was amazing, that was fantastic. I said, was that method acting, what were you doing? And she looks at me and she says, no darling, you had a hair in your face, and I was trying to let you know. <laughs> and somehow after this, I thought I could have a career in film and TV. <laughs> but then again, I've always, been a, I've always been an optimist. I've been one of those very, very positive, you know, you can do it type of people, probably annoying at some times. Being that I'm an optimist, I was um, shocked when these four words came out of my mouth. The night was December 18th, 2013. The four words were, I wanna die. You see, the night before, I had a heart attack. You know, as a lifelong athlete, former professional football player, gladiator, I put a lot of value in what I could do with my, my physicality, my body. So the heart attack wasn't only a setback, it shattered the entire definition of who I was. You know, I was weak, I was fragile, and I was broken. You know, I believed that, you know, life would never be good for me again. And I thought, if I couldn't live life on my own terms, then what was the point? right? But lying there in the hospital, I promised myself one thing. I promised myself that I would not be that grown man crying and weeping and feeling sorry for himself in the hospital. I would just not allow that to happen. But I learned something important in that moment. I learned that sometimes the grief we feel, it's larger than our human capacity to hold it. And then I just started crying. I was laying there in the hospital, uh, just, just bawling. And I was feeling sorry for myself and I kept asking myself, you know, why me, why me? Why did this happen to me? And I did everything right. I ate all the right foods, I took all the right supplements, I trained like a beast, you know, why me? And I, just wept. I was this grown man weeping and, until I had no more tears. Then in the calm, another thought occurred to me. And that thought was, instead of asking myself, why me? I changed the question and I started to ask myself, what can I be? The second I changed that question, all these ideas and thoughts and things came pouring forward. I said, hey, look, I can be an example of how to come back after a setback. I could show people how good life could be after a heart attack. And maybe, you know, just maybe in the best case scenario, I could take a personal hardship and turn it into a gift of inspiration for others. Then another thought occurred to me, and that was a broken heart does not mean a broken man. 
And I realized that I'd always been more than my body. That there was this spirit inside me, this light that burned bright, that allowed me to achieve any and everything I ever had. And that light, that light was still there. That light was still burning bright. So I made a vow that day in the hospital. I made a vow to burn bright or die trying. I spent the next few years doing a deep dive on and, and researching. I researched philosophy, meditation, religion. Uh, I looked at tons of papers. I interviewed hundreds of people, all with one goal. And that was, how do we live a happy, fulfilled, and meaningful life? Well, the first thing I... <laughs> That's true, right? How do we live a happy, fulfilled, meaningful life? It seems to be a, a big quiz for a lot of us, and it was for me. You know, the first thing I realized as I look back at my life is I realized I made it so damn hard for myself to feel happy. You know, I, I had tied all my happiness to what I achieved. That's just the way I was raised. I think a lot of us are culturally programmed that way. You know, we put our heads down. We work hard. Then when we accomplish something, and only when... Do we allow ourselves to feel happy? But I found that that happiness was always short-lived because I was always chasing the next thing. In truth, you know, I was constantly grinding, I was stressed, and I was perpetually unsatisfied. See, what I was doing is I was chasing gratification. I didn't understand gratitude. You know, once I started practicing gratitude, oh man, my life changed in amazing ways. I mean, I really believe that uh, gratitude and appreciation are the gateway to happiness. Uh, and I think the easiest way I found to practice gratitude was focusing on the simple things in life, the small things, the everyday moments of human beauty and truth. You know, it could be uh, your kid's laughter, the smile of someone you love, an amazing cup of coffee in the morning, hitting all the green lights. So when I come across one of these moments, I came up with this gratitude practice, I'll call it, uh, to find a way that I could have it, like, <clears throat> stick in my body. You know, it would stay with me. I could retain it. Now, it's um, very, very complicated. Sorry to say. And it's also very, very, very uh, high tech. So I thought maybe it was best if I had an image that could help explain it. <laughs> you know, most people think what's going to make them happy in life is the big things, right? Maybe it's buying a fancy mansion, it's getting that fancy sports car. It could even be something crazy like going on a date with a gladiator. But the truth is, uh, the research tells us it's not the magnitude of events that makes us happy, it's the frequency of them. So each day, my practice is I find three moments of everyday happiness and I make a deposit in that bank. And every time I do, I accompany it with a gesture and a physical sound because when we do this, the retention goes up exponentially. My move is ka-ching. Now, I'm not sure the hips always do that. <laughs> that might just be here, so I have to pay notice, but it's ka-ching. So when I come across one of these moments in life, let's say I'm walking and the sun, you know, feels good on my face. I'll take a moment and I'll express gratitude for it. I'll say thank you and I'll say that sun feels great on my face. And then I'll go ka-ching <laughs> and make that deposit in my bank. And I know it seems like a little thing, but when we make these deposits in our happiness bank every single day, it's like compound interest. Your happiness grows and it starts to flow into other areas in your life. I've done this every day and it's made a profound, profound difference in my life. I'm happy every day. The next thing I learned um, is uh, I learned to never say someday. Because after a heart attack, I know time isn't guaranteed. You know, we all run around here thinking that we have so much time. You know, we don't. 
My dad died at uh, 58 years old. <sighs> he, died at, he died at 58, and there were you know, all these conversations that I wanted to have with him, you know, that I told myself uh, someday. And now, you know, I'm just left holding these conversations I'll never get to have. So if there's something you want to do in life, maybe it's take that trip. Maybe it's look up an old friend. Maybe it's really look your partner in the eye and tell him you love him. Now, now's the time to do it. The third thing, in my research, I came across this quote by the Dalai Lama. And this quote just totally blew my mind. <laughs> it just blew me away. And what the Dalai Lama said, he said, in every human interaction we have, we have the choice to make the person happier or less happy. Right? And I know a lot of people think that one person can't make a difference. But think of all the interactions you have each day at home, with your family, at work, at the grocery store, with your friends. And if we would all just take one moment and pick it up from our cell phone and look at the human being across from us and take a moment to lift them up, it would make a tremendous impact on the world. There is this um, scientific principle. It's called upstream reciprocity. And what upstream reciprocity means is that if you're kind to somebody, if you lift them up, there's a great likelihood that they will go on and lift somebody else up. So the way it works in the real world is, let's say you go home and you lift up and you empower your daughter. Your daughter feels empowered. So she goes to school and she empowers her friends. Her friends feel empowered, so they go empower their friends. And it creates this beautiful ripple effect of happiness in a world I think needs it right now. Would you agree? When we live this way, when we take the Dalai Lama's word to heart, it gives each and every one of us in the audience the power to change the world one human interaction at a time. Now, that's a world I'm excited to live in. The last thing I learned about how to live a happy, meaningful, and fulfilled life wasn't something I learned from a book or, or through research. Uh, I learned it the night I was in the hospital and after the heart attack, and I wasn't sure if I was going to live or die. At that time, there was only one thing that was important to me. I didn't care about the size of my home. I didn't care about the make of my car. I didn't care about the plaques on my wall. I only wanted one thing. I wanted the people I loved close to me, and I wanted them to know how much I loved them. In the end, nothing else mattered. I lost my mom uh, three months ago to cancer. As I look back, I can say that, you know, having a heart attack might have been the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, it taught me, uh, it taught me what was important in life. It taught me what I loved in life. It taught me that, uh, you know, even as heartbroken as I was at the prospect of losing my mother, it taught me to have uh, gratitude for the time I had left with her. It also taught me that I had the power to lift her up. So each, so each and every time I went and saw her, no matter how bad cancer took its toll on her, Each time and I told her how beautiful she was, and 
I told her how much I loved her. You know, in her, in her final days, as it got towards the end, you know, my sister and I, we made sure that uh, everybody she loved and everybody she cared about was close to her, and they were by her side. Because I know in the end, I know in the end, you know, nothing, you know, nothing else matters. But love, connection, and relationships. You know, my mom, uh, after every conversation we had throughout my life, she would say the same thing at the end of it. She would say, ganbate. Now, ganbate is a Japanese word. There's not a literal translation, but it means to keep your chin up, to keep going. So for my mother, for everyone here tonight, I say, ganbate, keep your chins up, keep going. Thank you. Thank you.